Hello and welcome to episode 112 of Driver's Who's Blog Radio. As always, I'm your host, David G. Firestone. This is going to be an all-wrestling podcast. And let's be honest, a lot of crazy shit can happen in a week, and there's a lot of stuff that I just, I have to talk about. Because it's amazing how much weird shit can happen in a short amount of time, especially in wrestling. Now, let's start with AEW, specifically a wrestler by the name of Darby Allen. Now, at the time of last week's podcast, I had written and recorded it on a Sunday afternoon. So, later that evening was AEW Revolution, which was Sting's final match. Um, It was basically a no-rules tag team championship match between Sting and Darby Allin, who were the championships, and the Young Bucks. Now, Sting, in his final match, came out on top, but nobody was talking about that after the fact. All anybody was talking about was the Darby Allen glass spot. Now, outside of the ring, you had a large pane of glass, which I believe to be real glass, though I cannot confirm this with 100% accuracy, set up on a bunch of chairs. Uh, There's a 12-foot ladder, maybe even 15 feet tall, in the ring, which is significantly higher, and one of the young bucks is laying on the glass, Darby Allen does a front flip off the ladder, commonly referred to as a swanton bomb, and the buck on the ladder moved, and Darby clashed, crashed through the glass. Try saying that three times fast. Uh, glass went everywhere, and Darby Allen suffered a series of cuts. Glass was flowing into the ring, into the crowd, everywhere. Now, before I give my take on this, this is an article from Dave Shearer on PW Insider. Uh, link in the description. The, the article is called AEW Crossed the Line That Should Have Never, Ever Been Crossed by a Wrestling Company Last Night. Quote, At the AEW World's End Media Scrum last December, AEW owner Tony Khan, while wearing the infamous Tony Storm wig and glasses, we'll get to her later, was asked about an unproven rumor of alleged sexual harassment happening in AEW years before and what kind of workplace environment AEW provides for its employees. Khan stated, quote, I think it applies to everyone in the company, women, men, and it's something that we're very serious about and we've had a policy in place and certainly anytime there's anything like that we make sure we do everything we can to prevent it AEW has the best safety record I believe of any pro wrestling company in the world not even close to true Tony just go look on YouTube if you don't believe me anyway back to Tony Khan I believe we have the most safe environment I believe we have the best safety record of any pro wrestling company I will hold the record of AEW on safety against any wrestling company in the world and I think AEW is the safest place for pro wrestling Okay, so Khan is promoter and eternal optimist when it comes to anything pertaining to his company. Everything is always great and nothing is ever bad. We all not know that very, very well. Of course, in reality, despite the words he stated a few months ago, our eyes tell us that his statement is nowhere close to being true. We see people getting dropped on their heads, unprotected, on almost a weekly basis. We see dangerous spots where talents quote-unquote make it look real because it actually is real. We see finishing matches where where finishing moves are stiff and leave a mark and transition onto spots that aren't sold and actually lead to more similar spots which take a toll on EW wrestlers and people in a steady manner to their always full injury list. So when Tony made a claim about how safe AEW's environment is, only the dimmest of the dim believed the pal- pablum he was spewing. Those of us with an IQ over 70 have all seen enough to know that AEW is a much more dangerous environment than WWE because of what Khan allows his wrestlers to do. Hell, maybe he even asked them to do it. Who knows? But in any event, they do unnecessarily dangerous things on a regular basis because he doesn't stop, so he is complicit as what is being done. Sadly, there is nothing new here. Sure, smart people know that wrestling is a physical business and working in it for any length of time will take its toll physically on most people who aren't smart, limit as much abuse to the bodies as they can. Now to me, Darby Allen clearly seems to have a death wish. He may be the nicest guy in the world. I don't know. But what I do know is that he is one of the most reckless people I've ever seen work in a wrestling ring. Anybody who thinks up that spot and says, quote unquote, that's a great idea, is someone who I would never allowed to have the final say on any kind of spot. Hell, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't even have let him have any say in the 
in any spot if I are in charge because he clearly doesn't take his own well-being into account. If Darby wants to die in and around the ring, that's his choice, I guess, but I wouldn't allow him to do it for my company. If Tony Khan is going to be a party to what we saw last night and be sued by Darby Allen's family if he does... Oh, excuse me. If Tony Khan is going to be a party to what we saw last night and be sued by Allen's family if Darby actually does achieve what he seems to be his ultimate goal, fine. That's their call, but it's not the... But that's not the worst of what happened last night. Let's forget for a second that wrestling is supposed to be work and there's, there is no safe way to go through a sheet of glass that high in the air and it can't be quote-unquote done safely. Let's ignore the addition of him getting come up. The glass did nothing to stop his fall, you know, like a table does. So in addition to being sliced up, he also landed on the floor with a sickening and no doubt painful thud. We can also add that spot did nothing to add to Sting's last match and it's fair to say that at least some people... F- and at least to some people, it felt that it detracted from it due to the sheet, the sheer stupidity. It says sheet. It says it's supposed to be sheet. It says it's supposed to be sheer. It says sheet. Proofread, man. Stupidity and horror of watching Allen do that to himself. The bottom line here is that AEW proved last night it's not the safest place for wrestling, which is which again, fair, sane, smart people already knew. What AEW really showed us last night was that it's also not safe for his customers. If you doubt that, watch the video. At the very end, dimwit Darby goes crashing through the glass. Pieces go out flying at a higher speed into the crowd, hitting fans who paid for the most expensive seats. Nothing says you really care about your fans like spraying them with shards of glass, right? It's shards, not shards, but that's another thing. What's the new mod of AEW? Come to the matches, leave with stitches? It's only one it's one thing for Tony Khan to allow people like Darby to take years off their own life by doing stupid stunts. I guess one can make the case that if Darby wants to be in a wheelchair and eating out of a feeding tube for life, but by the time he's forty, that's his choice. Me, I wouldn't allow it, but I'm not also trying not to win a ridiculous booker of the year award that I lost to a guy that actually knows how to tell great stories and writes and and tries to protect his wrestlers as much as he can in Paul Levesque, aka Triple H. Maybe those kinds of spots are Tony's motivation to win his coveted award again. I don't know. I can't see any positive reason f- to allow Allen to do the spot. So maybe Tony will clear it up down the line, though I wouldn't waste my time waiting for him to do so. No matter how you feel about the spot, to splatter your paying fans with grass fragments? Who does that? Who could not see the exploding glass tends to, well, explode? And doing it in front of your ringside fans wasn't a great idea. Who couldn't see the potential to injure your customers and give them the opportunity to sue you for endangering them? Oh, I know, it's the same dimwit who came up with a spot in the first place and thinks the guy who runs the safest and the guy who thinks he runs the safest workplace environment in wrestling. That's who. Sweet Jesus, end quote. I have no idea how any modern fan could wa- could watch that and think that that is a good thing in any capacity. I really don't. Alan could have killed himself. He could have seriously injured people in the crowd. Again, every point that I wanted to make, Dave Shearer already said better than I ever could. What did this accomplish? Oh, we got people talking about the spot. Yeah, in much the same way people talk about Super Bowl spots in this day and age. It used to be that when you were talking about something that happened in wrestling, it was amazing. Oh, Stone Cold Steve Austin won the the WWE Championship at WrestleMania. Oh, The Rock and Hogan had a good match. Oh, you know, I could could come up with any number of examples. Nowadays, when people are talking about something that happened in wrestling, it's the stupidest shit ever. Oh, hey, Chuck Taylor blew people up with an invisible grenade. Oh, hey, uh, Joey Ryan flipped a bunch of wrestlers with his dick. Oh, hey, Darby uh, dove through a piece of glass for no good reason. Nobody's talking about it because it's cool. You Again, what did this accomplish? This was supposed to be... The, the send-off for one of the most respected wrestlers of his generation. Whether or not you like Sting, and some people don't, but whether or not you like Sting, <coughs> sorry, 
whether or not you like Sting it is kind of on the relevant. You can't argue with the career that he's had. You can't argue with what he's done in the ring. Even though he may not be the best worker, he's accomplished a lot in his career. More power to him. And the idea of just having Sting and Darby Allen just go out and have a good match with um, a, a couple of worthy opponents. No, you have to have, number one, you have to have the young Bucks. More like the middle-aged Bucks. The, the kind of people who will put themselves or the company in every opportunity. And they're, it, and they're um, also executive vice presidents, which is more than a little hilarious. But you have to make it no disqualifications so you can do this contrived garbage deathmatch bullshit that has been shown to end careers. There is absolutely no reason whatsoever that that spot had to happen at the point of the match when it did. There is no reason that a pane of glass needs to be involved in professional wrestling at all. Just why not have... Here's a novel idea. Here's what you could have done. You take Sting and Darby Allen, you put them in the ring with FTR, you let them have a good match, and the fans will go home happy. Wow, that was an amazing contest between four amazing athletes. But no, it has to be this contrived fucking, you know, garbage deathmatch bullshit that's been that's been wrecking wrestlers' bodies for years because a bunch of low IQ man children on the internet say, "Ooh, look at the broken glass. That's cool." Shut the fuck up. You wonder why people aren't watching wrestling anymore? This is why. This is why. I re- even in um when I was in um w- watching WWF in the 19 in the 90s. Yes, yeah, Stone Cold Steve Austin and Vince McMahon. That's a controversial name, but it is a valid thing. Uh, they, to be honest with you, McMahon and Austin, they were good friends backstage. Back then, they had their issues, but they're still uh, on each other's side today. They could get you to believe that they didn't like each other. They could get you to suspend your disbelief. Nowadays, it's like... You actually have people who don't like each other, and yet they they just it's just amazing to me how they nobody can get you to what I'm trying to say here is they can't get you to to suspend your disbelief anymore. They just keep hitting you about the head with the fact that wrestling is fake, wrestling is a work, it's not real combat. Yet nowadays, with the fact that it's being made to be fake combat, more people are getting injured. Kind of a not a coincidence. When you had, because you had for years, guys who were pretending to be uh, fighting, and they weren't getting hurt. But again, it's just people are when pe- when you give people. Okay, here's the point I'm trying to make. It's three o'clock in the morning, and I'm frankly just burned out. But when you give people the ability to make bad decisions without checking them, you deserve everything you get. And Tony Khan is going to get a lawsuit at some point, if he already hasn't, because I'm willing to bet that there's at least one or two lawsuits coming out of that match. Um, if he wants to do that, fine. But keep in mind, AEW is hemorrhaging fans. They're hemorrhaging TV viewers. They're hemorrhaging tickets. I mean... The last thing you want to do is give the fans a reason to leave. And any, if anyone who wants to take AEW down a few pegs, Tony Khan gave them that opportunity at Revolution. And you know what? He's going to give them more too. Because I'm willing to wager a boatload of money that there's going to be something even more stupid on the next pay-per-view. And I have a feeling I won't be going to cut a check in response to this loss. So I'm going to take a quick break. And I'm going to talk about some more wrestling stuff. Because it gets even crazier if you can believe that. I'll be right back.
Welcome back. So I've got two stories up next. One is AEW, one is directly related to AEW, and then I've got a bit of a rant about AEW. I know I'm dogpiling on AEW, but if they're going to keep giving me rope, I'm going to keep hanging them with it. So for the first story, we start with Sammy Quivara. Now, whether or not you love him or whether or not you hate him, he's very well established in AEW. He is extremely controversial. Between proposing to his girlfriend in the ring and then dumping her to marry Ty Conti, which you know, ticked off a lot of people, but let's be honest, looking at the girlfriend, looking at Ty Conti, I think he made the right decision. Uh, his ill-advised comments about Sasha Banks. Now, he made a very sexist comment about Sasha Banks, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It was really horrific. But I will give a, he does get a little bit of slack because at least he openly admitted that he made a mistake. He apologized to Sasha Banks personally. He never tried to deflect. He never tried to make it about another issue. He said, yes, I screwed up. This is my fault. And he accepted his punishments without question. I mean, th that's the way you should handle it. Yeah, what he said was disgusting. Yeah, he, what he said was horrific, but... He, he owned up to it and said, yeah, I was wrong. So I'll give him credit on that. Uh, he, had a, he injured Matt Hardy, uh, I think at a pay-per-view a few years ago. But again, that, there were outside factors in play. What had happened was they were doing a move off a scissor lift through a table, which, as we discussed previously, was meant to impact, to, to uh, soften the blow. Well, whoever set the scissor lift up had set it up too close to the table. So when they went through it, Matt hit his head on the concrete. Now, you could argue that it really wasn't Sammy's fault, but he still is sort of the one getting flack for it. Well, now his most recent controversial incident was against Matt was against Matt's, was against Matt's brother Jeff. Now, if you're familiar with Jeff Hardy, especially in recent years, he really shouldn't be wrestling anymore. Um, he, he really needs to just take... He, fortunately, he's injured, so he's going to have that time to just take some time off, uh, deal with his personal issues, and then once he's stable, come back. But um, it didn't happen. So on the February 16th episode of AEW Rampage, uh, uh, Hardy and Guevara were having a match, and towards the end of that match... Guevara attempted what is known as a shooting star press, which is a, uh, is, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to try to describe it because I don't have the terms here, but he attempts a shooting star press on Hardy, who gets his knees up to block it, but because of the way that Guevara's body was positioned, he accidentally kneed Harding in the face, uh, breaking his nose as a direct result. Now, you could argue, again, that AEW does have a lot of issues with botches and people being dropped on their head, which is, which is a fair point. But you can't argue w what happened wasn't stupid because it was reported last week that Sammy Guevara was suspended for, and I'm quoting, violating concussion protocol because the match was allowed to continue. Okay. Humor me. Why was this, why was Guevara suspended? And I'm being serious when I ask this. You have a referee in the match who is, if the referee senses that somebody's been injured, they're supposed to get involved and stop the match. That didn't happen. You have a number of people at ringside who should have been involved at stopping the match. That didn't happen. So why was Guevara suspended? If there was a concussion protocol in AEW, why weren't the people who were specifically tasked with ch with um, ensuring that this protocol is enforced get involved? I mean, yeah, you can argue that Guevara was at fault for the botch. I can't. I'm not saying that he isn't. But number one, it is wrestling, so accidents can happen in the ring. But why the other? why the entire group of people that could have gotten involved didn't and they aren't getting suspended because 
Um, those, yeah, those at ringside and the referee should have called for the match to be stopped, but they did nothing. And the only person here who's really not part of the blame is Jeff Hardy. I mean, he d- really didn't do anything wrong in this situation. But the idea that Guevara is the only one facing any form of punishment after this is baffling to me. I mean, you you have a chain of command where every link in the chain completely fails, but only one link in the chain is punished? How does that work? And if they have been punished, if the referee had been punished, if the ringside staff had been punished, it's not been heard of. There's a lot of leaks in that a lot of leaks in that ship when it comes to AEW. Now, and again, and again, wrestling by its very nature is dangerous. When you have people who are in charge of safety who fuck up their job, doesn't make it any safer. I've said it before. I'm kind of surprised we've not seen an in-ring fatality in AEW. I'm genuinely, legitimately shocked at that. It's amazing to me. It just um, it baffles my mind that the quote unquote safest work environment in wrestling has led to more injuries than any other wrestling promotion in the last twenty years combined. And the fact that there hasn't been an in-ring fatality is a miracle. So sticking with uh, AEW, we're going to talk about one of their partners now. There is a Mexican promotion known as CMLL, which is a partner of AEW. So I am not knowledgeable about how the U.S. issues work visas. And I wasn't prior to this story. But I had to talk about this because recently CMLL has run into visa trouble. Now this is the text of a PW Insider article. Again, link in the description. This one is by Mike, by um, respected wrestling journalist Mike Johnson. Quote, in a developing situation that could have in a, in a developing situation that could have quite a negative ripple effect on oncoming events, <coughs> PW Insider has learned that United States work visas for nearly 20 CMLL stars in Mexico are in the process of being canceled by the United States government. Once that happens, it could take months for new visas to go through the approval process and be issued. Uh, PW Insider is told that 19 luchadors are expected to be impacted and unable to perform in the United States. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna list these I'm not gonna list their names because I really don't want to get shit for mispronouncing them, which I'm probably going to do because I suck at pronunciation. Just listen to me. Anyway, back to the story. In speaking with those close to the situation, the visa blowup is the result of a Texas independent promotion, full blown pro wrestling, which runs Laredo and who had essentially sponsored the group visas for the CMLL talents, running into issues with CML management over the course of the visa process. PW Insider is told that CMLL head Salvador Luteroff, L-U-T-T-E-R-O-T-H, had placed other employees, one of whom was hanging up the legal department for CML, but has since left the promotion, in charge of the visa process on CMLL's end. PW Insider has been told that United States Department of Homeland Security contacted full-blown wrestling promoter Jerry Cadena with questions regarding the work visas. Uh, PW, parentheses, parent, PW Insider has not confirmed the specificity of the issue, and he was informed that he could be accused of fraud if the visas were flagged due to an issue. As the story goes, Cadena then com- contacted CML about working together to iron out the problems, but CML, CMLL's side claimed that they would take care of the issue via the United States Embassy in Mexico, and they wouldn't go beyond that statement. It should be noted that the Department of Homeland Security, not the embassy for a specific country, actually issues the work visas in the United States. We are told by one source that the belief on the CML side was that they would be able to handle it because a family member works for the embassy. Whether or not this could actually be the case remains to be seen. However, with CMLL no longer commuting with Kadena, but his name remaining on the line legally, the word is informed that the United States government. The word is that he is informed the United States government he is no longer have any intentions of working with CMLO going forward, and any agreements he signed to work with their talents is being terminated as of February 28th. So, what does this mean in the long run? 
Unless there is some sort of miracle to sort this out, which seems unlikely, the aforementioned talents will not be able to travel to the United States to legally perform until a new work visa is acquired for them. We are told that such a process could take months, a few months, if everyone pays some extremely expensive fees to expedite everything and everything goes as smoothly as possible, but at times the work pro visa process could take upwards of 6 to 12 months. So CMLL talents for WrestleMania weekend events in Philadelphia, New Japan's Windy City Riot, etc., may not actually be able to make those dates and perform again unless there's some sort of unless there's some sort of revolution or someone spends a lot of money to get the new visas in place. Which, while hoping they will be done in time for those big shows in the United States this spring. So obviously. CMLL is under the belief that because one of their employees has a family member working in the Mexican embassy that they can expedite this process. Um, and while CMLL does have a connection with AEW, it's obvious that this whole debacle started before that deal was inked. And to understand why the independent scene around WrestleMania weekend is critical, you have a lot of these smaller independent shows that have shows in... Um, the uh, city that WrestleMania is in, in this case Philadelphia, around the same time because you have a lot of wrestling fans and not all of them are going to get into WrestleMania. And if you look at what happened during the global pandemic, it was actually fairly devastating to the indie scene because some of these promotions require these shows to happen if they're going to make any money. So if you have a decent chunk of talent that has been advertised for WrestleMania shows that aren't going to be there, it's going to drive fans away. It's going to piss people off. And again, I don't blame the promotions. They were under the impression that this was a done deal. So I don't even blame them. Like It's not their fault that they're going to be false advertising. But it's not going to be a good look and it's not going to hurt. It's not going to help ticket sales. And I really hope that the indie scene thrives in wrestling. I really do. As much as I hate some of the shit that comes out of it, I do think there should be an independency. So, now I'm going to go on a bit of a personal rant about AEW. Now again, I get that wrestling in this day and age is about big characters. And big promos and presentation. You're basically selling the sizzle, not the steak. But there are just some times where enough is too much. In this case, we're going to talk about Timeless Tony Storm. Now, for those of you who don't know, she's a, um, I believe she's Australian, either New Zealand or Australia. I'm blanking on which. She was in uh, NXT, did reasonably well, got called up for the main roster, wasn't really used a bunch, asked and got her release, and then signed with AEW. And her first run was just as herself which really didn't go too much and then she debuted her new persona timeless tony storm what makes her timeless i hear you ask well her current character is out of a golden age hollywood starlet as part of this <coughs> <coughs> as part of this persona she has a butler named luther now, if you're familiar with Luther, he is a professional wrestler who was part of a, I think it was called Chaos Theory. And uh, he actually looks normal as her baller as opposed to when he's wrestling, which is actually an improvement. And she's got a sidekick named Mariah May, who not even the best 3D technology could bring any depth to this character. She has no personality whatsoever. I'm sorry. She, she's attractive, but she has no personality. So when Timeless Tony Storm first debuted, I actually was kind of into the whole thing. Because I, I did like the idea of, oh, I'm such a... Like, like, the idea of a heel being a narcissist who is full of themselves and thinks they're great. Okay, that works. I get that. I agree with it. That works. But it just went on. It just kept going. The longer it went, the worse it got. It just kept snowballing. The problem is, she, she's way too into her character. 
to the point that I just can't stand her anymore. I mean, yeah, she's good at cutting her a promo in character. I mean, no one's saying she isn't. No one's saying she's not bad in the ring either, because she is pretty decent in the ring. But the persona is just... Ugh. It just... It just the, the black and white thing, by the way... Yeah, she does her promos in black and white. But when she when you have a, a, a sit-down interview and one side of the screen is black and white for her and her opponent is in color, it just looks stupid. And I'm sorry, she's probably a nice person. Maybe she is, maybe she isn't. But her just being so over the top in terms of her character, especially when it doesn't really improve much, is kind of enraging. And remember how I said that... Um, I said in the previous segment that at the World's End Media Scrum last December, AEW Tony Khan was wearing the infamous Tony Storm wig and glasses. Number one, it wasn't a wig. It was a hat. It was like a Cossack hat. It was like a mini, um, mini Buckingham Palace guard hat and a pair of oversized sunglasses. If you actually go and watch the, the press scrum, you can find it on YouTube. She's completely in character to the point that I can't tell if she's either super into what she's doing or she's completely shit-faced drunk. Though, given that this was t- this was like at 1 o'clock in the morning, probably both. Um, and let's talk about AEW media scrums. Because... WWE does what they call what are basically press conferences. They let uh, sports and uh, wrestling and entertainment journalists into the event, and they get to ask all sorts of questions. Sometimes good answers are given, other times not. Just look at a uh, Cody versus Triple H on the Vince McMahon thing. With what a, with an AEW press scrum, what that basically is. It's a bunch of AEW friendly media outlets. Are AEW friendly media outlets asking questions? And when Tony Storm was answering questions, she literally had you preface the question by saying what your New Year's resolution was. And I'm sitting, and it's just, again, it's one of these things that was cool for a while. Now it's just gotten. Horf, just horrifically repetitive and at the end of the day I don't know how much longer she can keep this up but I have a feeling it's going to be for a while and again there are other characters in AEW that are uh, that are annoying me I mean the Young Bucks you got Orange Cassidy pretty much anybody in The Best Friends but this is one that has just gone so far over the top that is orbiting now. It's never going to come down. It's just orbiting eternally. And as and I just want to see this beaten in the ground. But like the Energizer Bunny, this is going to keep going and going and going. <sighs> and while toneless and while timeless Tony Storm might keep going on and on and on, this podcast is coming to an end. So, at the time of production. I am. I'm. I actually have some notes from the IndyCar and NHRA season debuts. Uh, I'm not gonna. I was hoping I could get to those this week. I just couldn't. I just ran out of time. So I'll do those next week. I'm Dave Frozen. Leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you then.